So I'm Britta, uh, I'm a developer at Elastic, and I work on Elasticsearch Core. And um, today I'm going to talk about uh, BM25, which is a method to uh, sort documents that contain natural language text, like articles or tweets or mails, uh, according to their relevance to some keywords. Okay, so this is about keyword search. And the reason why I'll be talking about it is because uh, from Lucene 6 on, with its next major release, uh, Lucene will be changing the default, which is currently TF-IDF, to BM25. And so will Elasticsearch, and so I guess will Solar. Um, so maybe Solar develops, yeah, okay. So uh, now is a good time to learn about it, because uh, once you start with a new release, your scoring might be a little different. And that's why I'm going to talk about it. So, so usually when I talk to people about uh, BM25, or when I didn't know anything about it, and say, okay, so what's BM25? Uh, they usually go like, and you all know, because you've stared at the slide for 10 minutes now, uh, they say, okay, <laughs> that's the probabilistic approach to scoring. And I had this conversation uh, with, with some people who never quite understood what it means, and then with one colleague, and I said, so, so what does it mean? And he says, hey, I don't know. <laughs> You're the one who knows the math, go figure it out. Or even better, give a talk about it. So uh, this is why I'm here. I um, thought I should figure out what's probabilistic about it and then give a talk about it. Uh, so I went to look at this thing. And so here it is. Uh, this is BM25 in all its glory. Um, and I, I don't know if you immediately see something probabilistic about it. Here, where's the probabilities? Who sees it? Oh, okay. Okay, so, so, so my first reaction was more like that. <laughs> Got a little scared because I had to talk the abstract already submitted and <laughs> didn't really get it. Okay. Um, okay, but I promise that this is actually not as as complicated as might seem at first glance. Actually, it's it's not super trivial, but it's uh, sort of easy to explain. And we're going to go through all the different parts of that during my talk. Um, but before we do that, uh, it is worth maybe spending a few minutes um, remembering why we should even bother to come up with such a monster. Uh, why is this even so complicated? Okay, so why is it so complicated to keyword search? Um, so some of you don't even have that problem. Uh, sometimes when you use a search engine for something, you're not so interested in any relevancy or any ordering of your documents, but you're only interested in uh, finding something, or maybe only counting. So if you have some hard criteria, like a particular date, or an order item, or a particular price range, and you just want to know which document has this criteria or how many have this criteria, you don't care in which order they are returned. Um, when you search in text, uh, this is usually a little more problematic, because when you do a keyword search, many documents might match, but you want to find those that best um, match your information need. Okay? Um, but this is a little bit problematic, uh, because language by itself is uh, fuzzy. Right? Uh, languages are both, so many words uh, that are in there don't even need for anything. Uh, then, of course, words are ambivalent, and uh, documents can cover many topics, and it's not clear just from your keywords if this document covers any topic that you're interested in or has your information need. So that's tricky. And on the other side, uh, what is even more tricky, or what's also tricky, is uh, for you, how do you formulate your search? How do you press your information need into a few keywords? Okay, and consider, for example, uh, consider this example, you have some sort of database where people that want to apply at your company put in their profile, right? And they can put in, okay, so what kind of languages do they speak? How old are they? How much working experience do they have? Do they want to, what, what do they want to earn? And you can filter by all these criteria, but when you look for somebody that actually matches your company or matches your needs, you usually look at the self-description. What do they write about themselves? And I suppose you had this database, and you would want to find someone who matches your criteria, who fits well into your team, who brings all the stuff that you really need to fill this job. And you would look in the self-description, want to build a search engine. Right? How do you put that? I mean, you want somebody who's a quick learner. You want somebody who works hard. You want somebody who's reliable, enduring. And, but you only have this search interface. So what you type might be something like, well, hardworking, self-motivated masochist. Um, and this is a really, a really inaccurate description of your actual information need. Okay, so when you, have a, when you build a search engine, it deals with natural language text and keyword queries. On the one hand, the search engine has this really verbose and really ambivalent text, and on the other hand, it has this information need which is just pressed into two or three keywords. So it's all super inaccurate and fuzzy, and it has to match these two things together to get the documents that are actually relevant for the user. 
And this is a super hard problem, as you can imagine, because you have so little information available. This is why it's so hard, there has been so much research on it, and also why I'm giving now a 30 minutes talk about it. Okay, so what's the purpose of my talk? Uh, so the first thing is we're going to go through all these terms in this equation. I'm going to show you what they actually mean. Um, and also, in particular, what these parameters do. So I see some parameters there, I'm going to discuss them later. Uh, what they do in practice. Uh, what does it mean for your scoring and what's going to happen to the scores. Um, I will also talk about uh, why BM25 has the label probabilistic. And this is actually the major part of this talk. And to be absolutely honest, it has not much practical relevance for you. This is mainly for your entertainment. And so that you can later on go and show off. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay? so I, I hope that I'll be able to convince you uh, that um, switching to BM25 is the right thing to do. And that's actually the hardest part of the talk. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to convince you, but, but I hope. And again, I hope that you're able to learn some buzzwords that you can show off with during the breaks, although there's not so many now more, but yeah. Okay, so before we talk about BM25 or the details of BM25, um, quick reminder what the current default is. The current default is TFIDF. And we stick with this uh, little artificial example. We're looking for an intern, and we'll see later why we need so many interns. Um, so we're looking for an intern. And uh, we look at the self-description for a self-motivated, hardworking masochist. And we want to find, order the applications, and there are many because your company is very successful. Uh, you want to order the applications by their relevance to these, this keyword query. Um, then the only evidence that we actually have for that something is relevant or not is uh, what is called the term frequencies. And that is the number of times these keywords that you type in are contained in the text. Okay, so what you do is you go, go through the text uh, and count how often are these keywords in there. That's the term frequency for each of these terms. Um, and as you know, I mean, it's tricky even to figure out where words start, where words end, uh, how to lowercase them and what have you. This is all the scene part, so we just assume we have that thing. Okay, so we get the term frequencies, and from this, uh, TF-IDF computes some score by which the document is ordered. And there is, uh, just summarizing that very, very quickly, so there's three major tweaks, okay? First is, we take this term frequency, sum this up for each keyword that matches, and we say more is better. Okay, so the higher the term frequency, the more score it gets. And this is a, uh, it's not a linear function, it's a, a square root of the term frequency, but this is basically what TFIDF and Lucene does right now. Okay, this is the first thing. Uh, this is a, unfortunately a little tricky to just use that, because uh, if you have very common terms, for example, the, or a, or who, and these are terms that occur in nearly every English document that you're looking at. So the term frequency will be rather high in each uh, English document. So if a user types one of these words in their search query, this will screw up your score completely. Okay, this is why, why this um, criteria is weighted by something else. It's called the inverse document frequency, which basically means that uh, common words, or words that appear more often in your corpus, or that are common to many documents, are less important. Okay, and this is called the inverse document frequency. So document frequency is how often does, or in how many documents does a term occur, and inverse document frequency means, okay, so the more often it occurs, the lower this value gets. So this is this higher term frequency means lower score. And this is actually multiplied with this term frequency. And then it's all summed up. Okay, so that's the second tweak. And the third is, uh, now imagine, for example, you have a tweet uh, that matches well and has a certain term frequency, and you have a book that has the same term fre frequency, and you might imagine that this tweet is actually about that term, whereas a book that has a thousand pages and the term only occurs five times is maybe about something completely different. <laughs> okay? And to also incorporate this intuition into TF-IDF, uh, we'll see now also uses the length. Uh, of the document, and by length of the document means how many terms are contained in your field. Okay, and again, the more terms are in there, the less um, well relevant the whole document actually is. So this is here, and this is also I think one divided by the square root, right? So shorter, higher score, longer, lower score. This is the three major things in Lucene. Okay, there's one more thing um, uh, that Lucene does with TFIDF. Um, and I consider, for example, the following example. You have uh, 
So you're looking for something, you want to do a holiday in China, and you're looking for documents that match that to get a description of what's good, what's not good, and so on and so forth. And you have these two documents. One is, uh, describes my holiday in Beijing, whereas the other one is the economic development of Sichuan from 1920 to 1930. Um, then both will probably contain the word uh, China rather often. Holiday might only be contained in, in this blog post. right? But if this document contains China very, very often, it has the same length, and this only sometimes, and holiday only sometimes, this one will score higher, even though it's definitely not what you really intend to find. Right? So, and it, this stems from the fact that TF-IDF always assumes more is better. Um, and to adjust your score again a little bit to that, uh, Lucina is something that's called the cohort fa factor, and in roughly what it does, it rewards uh, documents that match more than one query term. So this one would be adjusted accordingly so that it scores higher than the one that only matches one query term. Okay, this is a hack. It's a little bit of a hack in bull query. Um, any you seen developers here? Okay, I can't just raise. I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, there's... Okay, oh yeah. <laughs> the awesome Lucene programmers made this hack. So... <laughs> Okay, so what's wrong with TFIDF? I mean, TFIDF is actually quite nice, right? It's been successful since the... Oh, what just happened? Uh oh <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, it's the wrath of God, huh? <laughs> Oh, no. <sighs> okay. Good. Okay, TFIDF. As I said, successful since the very beginning. It was the, score, uh, the, the first scoring algorithm they had, and it's still the default, right? So successful since the beginning of Lucene. It's pretty well studied. It is super easy to understand, as you just saw, I hope. Um, and it's, uh, well, uh, it's a one size fits most. Right? Most people are more or less happy with it. Um, so, so the question is, why, why do even bother? Why, why would we have to come up with something else? And the thing is that TFNDF, it is a heuristic, but it also means it's somewhat a guess. Right? Somebody sat down and thought, okay, so um, if I add up TF, that's nice. If I take the square root, it's even a little bit better. So let's take the square root. <laughs> or, uh, okay, if I divide by the length, that's fine. But if I divide by the square root of the length, that's also nice. Hmm. So, so try all these different things, and then this is, this is the final result. And the question is, maybe, maybe we can do better. Maybe we can be a little bit smarter about it, and then our score might be better. That was the basic idea. Okay, so how did we get to BM25? Uh, and it all starts with something uh, that is called the probability ranking principle. And I'll just give you the abridged version. There's a much longer version of that and a much better definition. But um, basically what is said is if, if retrieved documents are ordered by a decreasing probability of relevance on the data available, then the system's effectiveness is the best that can be obtained from the data. Um, which by itself maybe sounds a little trivial. Because, I mean, you could think, okay, you have your document, I just have some probability that it's relevant, and then of course the one that has the highest probability should be up front, and the others should be scored lower, right? So, um, but there is uh, two things that are actually really exciting about it. And I mean, the, the basic idea is you, you try to put your intuition into some mathematical framework of probabilities, right? And this means on the one hand, if you actually manage to put it into some uh, probabilistic framework, you might actually be able to incorporate prior knowledge on your data into your scoring algorithm, meaning you can do machine learning. Yay. Um, so that's the one thing that's exciting about it. And, and the other is, if you manage to put it into a probabilistic framework, you don't have to do the math, because hundreds of mathemat mathematicians have done the work already for you. You just have to look up in the right places. Right? So, so that's the cool thing about uh, trying to use a probabilistic framework. Uh, it also means that now we're going to do a little bit of math. Okay, so for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, think as mathematicians, even if you're not into math. Okay, and by that I mean, uh, let go of all practical considerations. <laughs> you, you don't care how many CPUs you need, or how many interns you need to hire, or if they jump from the roof, you don't care, right? <laughs> and the other is, think of yourself as super smart. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> no, seriously, uh, it's, 
So, so that you might not, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I did a well enough job to actually explain everything on the next slides. If you don't get it immediately, don't worry, you're super smart, you can figure it out at home. Okay? So, well, okay. Okay, so what's the basic idea? Uh, so we can do fancy machine learning. Uh, what do we want to do? Okay. So we try to estimate the probability of relevancy. And we start with a simplification. That is, we say, OK, relevance is binary. Uh, a document is relevant given a query, or a document is not relevant. And um, note that even though this is a 1, 0, uh, it does not mean that the probability is 1, 0. The probability can still be a float. Right? But we first say, OK, relevance is something that's binary. Um, it cannot be half relevant. <clears throat> OK, and now what we could do potentially to gather some data is we could have our interns uh, give them a document, give them a query, and then they tell us, OK, this is relevant or this is not relevant. Okay. And then the hope is that we get, uh, they can use this data to actually estimate the probability of relevancy given some query. That's the basic idea. So we get all our interns, uh, we let them click all day, and then we end up with a set uh, of... <laughs> Come on, that's how it works. Actually, you have users, right? I mean, you can use user clicks. <laughs> don't, don't need all these entrants. OK, uh, so you want to have the set of all the documents per query, and then some of those are relevant, and some of those are not relevant. Um, OK, so this is the machine learning part. We're going to see later how this goes. Uh, but now the math part. What does this actually mean in math? Probability of relevancy. Um, and in math, how it actually looks like is we want to estimate uh, the probability that the relevancy is 1 given a document and a query. Okay, so this is the, the relevance, that's the random variable, can be 1 or can be 0. And this, this bar here means, okay, given that, so given for some document and some query, give me what the relevance is, the probability that the relevancy is 1. Right? And p just means probability. Um, and just, just to, so, so for those who are not too familiar with that, uh, the, the basic idea is you have some list, right? You have all your documents, and this is for one query. All your documents and relevancy is one. This we don't not interested in, and you want to get these numbers and then order the documents by well, this number highest gets up in front. So in this case, document three would be highest, but we don't know what's here. So, okay. The problem is that you need this list for all documents that you have and all documents that you haven't seen yet. And you need it for each query that you have in this particular formulation, right? And this is just a basic concept, uh, which is not super helpful right now. Um, and now here comes the part where the other exciting part, where I said before, okay, so it's good that it's in math because in math means we can just look up the the places that we need, and somebody else has done the work already for us. Um, so what we what we need is we want to try get this this uh, formulation of the problem into something that we can actually use. Meaning we want something that just like TF-IDF, where we can take the term frequencies, and from these term frequencies estimate this uh, probability. Right? So we have to reformulate that in terms of term frequencies. We maybe have to make some independence assumptions, and so on and so forth. Okay. And as I said before, somebody else has done that already. Uh, so I'm not going to show exactly how that goes. I'm just going to say here be math. Um, if you, if you want to know the details, the absolute details of how this computation works, it's not super lengthy or hard to explain, but it, it wouldn't fit in the talk. Um, you can look it up in this paper, the Probabilistic Relevance Framework, Beyond 25 and Beyond. That's an exceptionally well-written paper. It's, it's a really, what, seriously, 15 minutes? Oh. Well, what time is it? OK. OK. Uh. <coughs> Oops. <laughs> OK. Read this paper if you want to know the details. <laughs> That's all I want to say. OK, so they do all this computation, uh, try to uh, fit in the term frequencies, and so on and so forth, and get to some final result. I'm just going to discuss the result and then what comes after that. OK, this is the final. Oh, damn. Here is a W. There's a weight. <laughs> That's the W of the document. OK. Uh, so what we end up with is something that's actually not a probability. Uh, in between this computation, we got rid of the constraint that it has to be a probability. Instead, it's just some weight that would order the documents the same way that an actual probability would. Um, but what's interesting here is the right-hand side. So this little sigma just means, okay, sum up all the terms in the query where the term frequency in this document is greater than zero. Okay, just sum all of those up. And, and these parts here, these probabilities, what these actually mean is we have a list. So we have a list for the probability of the term frequency of hard working is 1, given that the relevancy is 1. The term frequency of hard working is 1, given that the relevancy is 0. Term frequency of hard working is 2, given that the relevancy of 1, and so on and so forth. 
Right? For each of these terms in our corpus, we need this list of numbers. And in the same way, we also need uh, the same for hard working does not occur in the document. And if you think and this is still a little weird, this is much better than what we had before, because what we now need is just to maintain one list per term in our documents. Right? And if we have this list, and if we have that somewhere stored, then once the query comes in, we can just look up these values in this list, plug it in here, sum it up, and be done, and we had our perfect relevancy score. Okay, but then of course the question is, well, where do we get these lists from? Huh. It's a little better than before, but where do we get them from? Okay. So, how do we estimate these probabilities? Uh, first shot at that is we make a um, dramatic but useful simplification. Is we use the binary independence model. We say we don't care about frequencies at all. We only care about if a term occurs in a document or if it doesn't occur in a document. And this sometimes makes sense in practice too. If you look in the tweets or chat messages where you wouldn't think that a term occurs more often than once or where you wouldn't care if it does. Okay, so in that case you can actually make that assumption. And then per query and per term, you only have, uh, or per term, you only have uh, a set that contains, well, documents that are not relevant and do not contain the query term. Some are relevant, uh, some contain the query term, and some are relevant and contain the query term. Right? And if we had this set for each of our terms, because our interns clicked so uh, endlessly, if we could get these numbers, maybe we could, could uh, estimate these probabilities from these numbers. Okay? And we can. Um, so this is the way this would go. Uh, we say, okay, probability that the frequency is one, given that the relevancy is one, is really just the relevant documents that contain the term divided by um, the relevant documents. Right? This is this probability. It's a max maximum likelihood estimate. And if you're into statistics, you might say, oh, no. Uh, but, okay. Uh, and, and there's some smoothing factors there that are not uh, super important for the course of this talk. But uh, anyway, if they had these numbers, this is how we actually could compute that number. Uh, and then we could do the same for frequencies one given relevancy zero, right? And then get the frequency zero just by one minus the other thing. Okay. And then for frequency two or relevancy one, we don't care, right? Because we, we made this binary independence assumption. So, to summarize, right? Uh, we, we take these sets, right? We compute these four probabilities. We plug this into this weight equation into these four terms. Uh, whenever we encounter a term, sum them up for each of the query terms where that actually occurs, and then we have our perfect score. Okay? Um, and if we do that, if we plug, if we plug these, uh, these, uh, these terms that we just saw really in here, what we end up with is the robertson spark jones weight. Now, this is something that you, you might or might not have heard ever since, but something you can impress people with. If somebody says, okay, I am losing the scene six, yeah, it uses the Spark the Robertson Spark Jones weight. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> so this is what you end with. So you have this, 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 this equation here. This is really just the counts that are in these sets, right? And this is how it was derived. Okay, so if you have an unlimited supply of interns, you let them click all day, you get these sets, you compute for each of the terms, compute this number, end up with one list for moderated work and experience and so on and so forth, and then whenever something matches a query, you just sum these numbers up for these terms and then you get your perfect score. That's the basic idea of that. Unfortunately, you don't have that normally. Um, and the fun thing is you can still use the robertson spark jones weight, uh, but make a really funny assumption, and that is that uh, the number of documents uh, that are relevant is, is zero. Which, which sounds a little odd in the very beginning, but if you actually do the math, go back and set this to zero here, then you actually end up with something. It doesn't just vanish, but you end up with something that's actually useful. And this is called the uh, inverse document frequency for, well, for BM25. Just to give you an idea how that looks like, uh, so this is on a logarithmic scale. Uh, here you have the document frequency, you have the inverse document frequency, again, logarithmic scale. You can see, okay, it decreases, right? from 10 and then to 1, and then it uh, decreases even further to 0. And this in comparison to the, the IDF that you get from TF-IDF, decreases, decreases, but then stays the same. And what this means is that um, uh, very, very common words are scaled even lower than they would be in TF-IDF. Right. So this is just a major difference here. Okay, so that's that part. It's the inverse document frequency that says, okay, how popular is the term actually in the corpus? It comes from this robertson spark jones work and the assumption that relevant document or number of relevant documents is zero. 
Okay, so now, uh, second part, uh, we said, okay, we, we don't care about TM frequencies. That's what if we do care about TM, term frequencies, right? What does the term frequency tell us about relevancy? And in TF-IDF, it was easy. We said, okay, more is just better. Um, but for BM25, people were asking actually a different question, and that was, well, what does the term frequency actually tell us about if a document is about a term or not about a term? Uh, this, is, uh, this, this property is called eliteness, and it's a little weird concept, so I'll give you an example. Example for eliteness, if you, for example, look for the term tourism in, in Wikipedia pages, you will find uh, the word tourism on nearly every page that is about a country. Um, nearly every page. Okay, but these, uh, these pages are not actually about tourism, right? There is pages that are dedicated to tourism, like there's a page for ecotourism or there's a page for dark tourism. Right? These are actually about tourism, the others are not. So just because it occurs there doesn't mean it's actually, the document is about this particular term. And this might be something that is uh, important for our scoring. So the question is, can we, can we use a prior knowledge on the distribution of term frequency and eliteness to get an even better result? Okay, and the idea, the basic idea is, we have two cases. We say a document is not about what is described by the term, and we, we would probably assume that the term frequencies are distributed as such. So, the probability that this document, uh, for to observe this term frequency in a document that not actually is about that term, would be higher than that the term frequency is higher. Right, and then if the document actually is about the term, we would usually assume that uh, well. To the probability that we observe a higher term frequency is also higher, if the document is about that term. And note that this might not always be the case, right? This red line might also be here, right? Or, or somewhere else, but this is, the, this is the basic assumption. Okay, so we need to get this distribution, once for the uh, documents that are not about the term and once for those that are about the term. Right? So we need to, in many documents that have different term frequencies, and we'll see in a minute what we do, so we need all different documents with different term frequencies, and again ask our intern, well, here is this document, here is this term, is this term actually elite to this document? Yeah? Okay, and then our interns will go, huh? <laughs> or <laughs> hopefully they say, yeah, it's elite or it's not elite. But we need many more, right? Many more, because we need all these different frequencies to handle too. Okay, so we need more interns. I click all day and do that. Um, so then we get a notion of eliteness. Uh, but then the question is, okay, so we know it's elite, uh, but we do not know yet, is, is it relevant or is it not? Is the document relevant or not to our query, right? So we need another relationship of eliteness and relevancy. Okay, and here, so as we have these curves here, how does it tie to relevancy? And what we can do here is we could do the same trick that we did before, right? We could say, okay, we have another distribution. It's uh, the probability of eliteness given relevancy. And if we know the eliteness already and can tie this other distribution into that, maybe we get something better out of it. And here I'm going a little faster because I uh, oh, don't have that much time. But we would do the same trick as before. We try to get our sets because this is a binary variable. This is a binary thing, so we can just take these sets. Again, compute, uh, have elite documents, have relevant documents, uh, have elite documents that are relevant and some that are neither, and then try from that to estimate, estimate this probability. Okay. But it means we need this set, okay? So we need even more interns. <laughs> so, okay, but suppose we had that. Again, we're mathematicians, and bear with me just one more minute, right? So we're mathematicians, we don't care. Okay, we have all that. We can get as many interns as we want. So we can get this distribution of the term frequency given the eliteness. We can get the probability of eliteness given relevancy, right? We can try to combine this two into a probability of frequency given the eliteness, and this is really what, uh, uh, relevancy, and this is really what, the want, what we want, yeah? Plug this in here, and then hopefully get something that we can use in practice, okay? And again, here be math, I'm not going to show you. There's not so much that happens there, to be honest. Um, so here be math, <laughs> and we get to... So, okay, something that is actually too long to fit on the slide. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really help, so all the math, all the results of other people doesn't really help. We get something that is pretty nasty. And then this paper that I cited before, this all described in there, uh, you can take a look and I just quote from that, that the result is a somewhat messy formula. And uh, furthermore, we do not generally know the values of the parameters uh, or have an easy way to estimate them because we don't have all these interns. Right? Um, and that's a bummer, and I think it was also a bummer for the authors, um, I guess, of, of BM25. And, and to me, I, I, think, I think the major achievement of the authors of BM25 at this point was not just to give up and say, hey, okay, 
we reach the dead end, there is nothing we can do, but to still cling on to that and make something out of that. Okay, so what did they do? I found a video on YouTube where a guy describes that. He says, they took a leap of faith. <laughs> okay, so what is this leap of faith? Um, well, they say, well, okay, so we cannot really get the proper shape of this, this, this monster, uh, which I didn't show you. Um, but we can still have some, use our mouth and get some description out of that. So, for example, we know that this curve would start at zero. We know it would increase monotonically. Uh, we know it would approach a maximum at some point, and then not any further. And the maximum would be the inverse document frequency that we computed before, which is nice. Okay, so they said, hey, we just use something similar, even though we don't know what it is. Um, and so what they came up with was called the term frequency saturation curve. Uh, and it basically looks like this. So you take the term frequency, but you don't just sum that up or sum the square root up, but you divide it by the term frequency plus some parameter. And as you can see, as term frequency grows, this whole term will approach one, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, I'm speaking as quick as I can. Um, <laughs> Okay, and, and this is here multiplied by the IDF. So this parameter key, you can choose it freely. I think the, the default is two right now. Somebody, okay, yeah. Um, and so if you, have a, if you have a higher K, it'll approach the slower. If you have a, a, a smaller K, it'll approach it quicker. Okay, and this is the, uh, um, so this is the basic difference also to, to TF-IDF, because in TF-IDF, the square root of the term frequency, that would just grow infinitely, right? Okay, so. We are here. This is the part, the last part of the, this is the saturation curve of BM25. Okay, and now finally, and then I'm going to cover this a little more quicker. Um, uh, so one thing that, uh, that I was uh, not really mentioning when I talked about the Poisson distribution is that we sort of assumed that all documents have the same length. Okay? And this is something that also doesn't work for BM25. We have to somehow take the length into account. And the way they did it is they say, okay, uh, they interpolate uh, between one and the, uh, the, the average document length and have this a factor to this k. Okay, so this is an interpolation of one uh, and the, the, the average document length. And this is important later on. The, the, they take the average document length and not just the length or the square root of the length or something like that. This is something relative to what you encounter in your corpus. And just to give you an idea what that does, now this is... Uh, uh, here's the document length, right? And here's the score that would be computed for different parameters. Again, B is a parameter. If you choose B to be very small, uh, it will have little influence uh, on, the, on the score, or little influence on the difference of the score. If you choose B to be a little bigger, it'll have more influence. So this would be this, this uh, black curve here. Again, this is different to, to TF-IDF, where, well, the, you still have some decrease, but you don't have the flexibility to actually choose how much influence the length actually has. Okay, so we're done. <laughs> this is uh, VM25. Uh, this is all the parameters and, uh, that you see. So we have the IDF, how popular is the term in the corpus, uh, limit the influence of the term frequency, and then also the length weighting. Okay, so, and so finally, the question is BM25 probabilistic? Um, I mean, I, I showed you not all of the approximations, but some of the approximations. And uh, as I said, the it is originally probabilistic, but since it's impossible to get the, uh, only uh, possible to get the probability right with unlimited data, I would say no, it's not really. It's inspired by probabilistic ranking. This is also from this YouTube video I showed before, and I would totally agree. Okay, a short history, um, just to give you an idea what time frame we're talking about. It started about 1975 when they had this Robertson Spock Jones weight and uh, Probabil probability ranking principle and all this Poisson distribution, that's what it means here. And, and it took until uh, 1994, until the final BM25 was actually published. Right? And after that was the first Lucene release, but that still took TF-IDF. And then only in 2011, uh, David Nemeski, um, uh, that's, a, that's a guy who participated in the Google Summer of Code, together with Robert Moore, actually made similarities uh, in Lucene Pluggable and also implemented BM25. And it took until now, so 2016, till actually the fault was switched to BM25. Right? So just to give you an idea how long this took. Okay, so will I get a best scoring in BM25? Now it gets tricky. Um, there's, some, there's some pros, some definite pros with uh, BM25. So one is this frequency cutoff. Right. Uh, so TF-IDF, uh, common words influence the score, 
uh, much more than they would be with BM25, right? So because BM25 naturally limits, this, uh, limits the influence. Okay. It also means that we don't need this cohort factor hack anymore. If you remember that example with China and the, the blog post about Citroën and uh, blog post and this other article, uh, so cohort factor you can actually switch it off. If you're if you're using Elasticsearch, uh, you can switch it off by index similarity dot default dot type spm25 and then it'll not be used anymore. Um, okay. So uh, other benefits, although I'm not sure I should advertise that too much, uh, is you can potentially tweak the parameters. Oh, that's tedious, and I'm not sure if it's really worth it. Uh, but you can if you want. If you're using Elasticsearch, you close your index, update your mappings, and then reopen the index, and then uh, it'll use different parameters. Um, the thing that's more interesting is that this whole paper actually describes a mathematical framework to build non-textual features into your scoring. So if you're looking into, I don't know, um, adding additional signals to your score, uh, it might be worth looking at the details there. We have a dedicated chapter for that. Okay, one warning. Um, TF-IDF has an automatic boost for short fields, so for title fields, for example. If you're using title fields right now and rely on this automatic boost, it will not work as well, with, or not work as well, will work different with BM25, because BM25 takes the average document's length into account and adjusts accordingly. Okay, so it's just a little bit of warming. Okay, and now is it better, finally? Um, literacy says yes, uh, challenges say yes, uh, users, some users say so, Lucene developers say so. Uh, uh, a guy who uh, works at Elastic had a blog post about it, had the feeling it was so, uh, but um, uh, actually we don't know. I'm making an educated guess here. Um, so it depends on the features of your corpus and it defines on, depends on uh, how your queries look like. We believe it will be better, but uh, yeah, you'll have to try it out. And you can try it out right now if you're lo losing Elasticsearch, you can actually try it out by closing your index, uh, updating the similarity accordingly, opening it again, and then see what happens. Okay. And then here is some useful literature, if you uh, want to read that stuff up. Okay, and uh, that's the end of my talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Too much, too, too, too much math. Okay, so thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you.